this is probably a good time to start. Um, welcome everyone. It's lovely to see a good crowd here for our keynote lecture this evening. Um, before I hand over to Beth Cullen, who's going to introduce Tim Ingold to us this evening, I thought I'd just like welcome you to the third and final symposium that's being organized by Monsoon Assemblages, the ERC-funded research project that I run and a number, and in fact, the whole team is dotted around the audience this evening. Um, it's been really great for us to hold these, these symposia. Um, it's really opened up a space of conversation for us as researchers, put us in touch with so many kind of into so many different disciplines, so many different people, and really kind of generated for us really useful conversations about our work and taken it in directions that actually it wouldn't otherwise have gone in. So these symposium are, are really, really they're very selfish things that we've actually set up for us to learn from others. Um, and we hope they've been, and they seem to have been enjoyable for others too. So thank you for being here. Um, if any of you would like to come to the symposium tomorrow, um, it starts at 9.30. We have programs at the back so you can see um, who is on the program for tomorrow. But thank you for being here this evening. Um, at this stage, I think I'll hand over to Beth Callan, who is an anthropologist um, on the Monsoon Assemblages team, to introduce Tim Ingold. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so we're immensely privileged to have Tim Ingold, uh, one of the most renowned voices in contemporary anthropology, to give the keynote lecture for Monsoon on Other Grounds this evening. Tim Ingold is Emeritus Professor of Social Anthropology at the University of Aberdeen and a Fellow of the British Academy and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Following 25 years at the University of Manchester, Tim moved to the University of Aberdeen where he was instrumental in setting up the UK's youngest anthropology department. Tim carried out his early fieldwork with uh, Skolt Sami people um, in the far northeast of Finland and has written about environment, technology, and social organization in the circumpolar north. His work has also covered the role of animals in human society, human ecology, and evolutionary theory. He's written and taught widely on how embodied processes and skilled practice shape the ways in which we perceive, understand, and dwell in the world. Recent work has focused on the interconnections between the four A's, anthropology, archeology, span art, and architecture as ways of exploring relations between human beings and the environments they inhabit. His books include The Perception of the Environment, Lines, uh, Being Alive, Making, The Life of Lines, and Anthropology, Why It Matters. Um, and I'd just like to say that Tim's thinking and writing on weather worlds, uh, lines and entanglement in particular, um, have greatly influenced our approach to the Monsoon Assemblages project. Um, and tonight's talk is, is titled, What on Earth is the Ground? Um, it's a perfect prelude to the conversations that will be occurring throughout the day tomorrow. Tim, it's a really great honor to have you with us here this evening. Thank oh, you. Thank you for having me. Uh, <laughs> well, um, what on earth is the ground? It's a surface, says the dictionary, a surface on which things or persons stand or move. But then you think, well, what, what kind of surface is it? Does it have one side or two? Does it cover the earth or does it cover it up? Can you roll it? Can you fold it? Can you cut it? Can you make holes in it? What lies above it and what lies beneath it? Indeed, the, the ground, is, we, we so often take for granted the ground. It's just what everything else is on. And we're interested in everything else. We say, well, there's the ground. But we forget about that. This, this ground that we take so much for granted turns out to be thoroughly elusive. Not even really sure whether it exists at all. So what I wanted to do is to have a go at figuring out what on earth the ground actually is. And I should say this is thoughts in progress. I'm, I'm still working this stuff out for myself. And we could perhaps start from a proposition 
which I actually had thought on the plane coming down this morning, the proposition that wherever there's ground, three things have to be present. First, you have to have Earth. Secondly, you have to have something that we could call air or atmosphere or weather. And thirdly, there have to be some things that are living, growing, moving around, sort of inhabitants. So you've got to have Earth, you've got to have something like atmosphere, you've got to have something like inhabitants. And perhaps we could start from the proposition that the ground is the coming together of all these things. But then, that's fine. The question then arises how these things bear upon and suffer under one another. That is, what is the relation between these three things? And in trying to think this through, suddenly what came to my mind was an ancient children's game. And I'm sure you've all played it at one time or another. Uh, it's called Scissors, Paper, Stone. Um, you know, you, 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 you and your friend pull out a hand, and one pulls out this, and another pulls out this, uh, and depending on what combination it is, you or your friend wins. And the, the logic of it is that uh, scissors defeat paper, um, so si because, because scissors cut paper. Paper defeats stone because you can wrap stone up in it, and stone defeats scissors because it blunts the edge. So it goes in that order. And the beauty of it is that, um, that, that, that not any of these three elements is all powerful. I mean, each can be alternatively agent and patient, so that their agency and their patiency is completely locked up in the cycle. So I was thinking about this game, and I thought, well, we could, we could do a substitution. We could say, let Earth stand for paper, let weather stand for stone, and let the inhabitants stand for scissors. So I, I grant you there's nothing much um, papery about Earth, and very definitely nothing very stony about weather or scissor-like about inhabitants, so never mind. We just, just make this substitution, and then think, well, what happens? Well. Firstly, inhabitants, that's uh, people, animals, maybe you'll include the roots of trees, I don't know, whatever you like. Inhabitants are moving around and growing, and as they do so, they inscribe marks or paths or trails in the earth, lines of one sort or another. So the earth is inscribed with the lines of inhabitants. Then, the earth itself is racked by massive geomorphological forces, we've heard a bit about them already today, which causes it to bend, buckle, crack, and fold. Maybe over a very long time scale, but anyway, we know that very well. And then the weather, with its winds, its storms, its rainfall, is continually eroding the surface of the earth and wiping out the tracks and paths and trails of the inhabitants. So, in this system, inhabitants trump the earth because they inscribe their lines in it. The earth trumps the weather because it is continually buckling up, and the weather trumps the lines of inhabitants. So we then have three separate movements. We have the movement of inscription, which is what inhabitants are doing to the surface of the Earth. We have the movement that I'll call eruption, which is the buckling up of landforms in geomorphological processes. And we've got the process of erosion, which is the one by which the weather is continually wearing these surfaces down. So it seems that with the ground, starting with these three elements and these three movements, we're dealing with a cycle of inscription, eruption, and erosion. And the question is how these link together. Each of these is a different kind of process. And not none of them is all powerful. All of them take part in the ongoing process <coughs> of formation of the ground. So let's take a quick look at each of these movements, inscription, eruption, 
erosion. Inscription is a movement that goes along in Paul Clay's famous image of taking a line for a walk. It doesn't, it doesn't start at one point and end at another point. So I could be just going along and I happen to be holding this pen in my hand with this amazing bit of technology here, which I shall operate for the first time. And just, just at the moment, my pen makes contact with the surface of the page here, and then it leaves off again. So there's a line. There's a trace of a movement. It's been inscribed. It didn't really start anywhere. It didn't really end anywhere. But at a particular point, pen got onto the page, and then it came off again. So the inscription, then, is the trace of a jester, and it simply carries on. But eruption is a bit different. If you think about it in terms of folding or cracking or creasing, it's like an interruption of the surface caused by forces intrinsic to the surface itself. It might be a like a fold or a crease or a crack. It might be something that arises over time. But the thing is that it does so simultaneously along its entire length. You get a fold line. That line is not going along like this one does. But I'll, I'll just try this. If I take this, take this off, and, and I'll um, imagine that I'm, I'm some geolo geomorphological processes here, and I, I'm forcing this in. So now I've, got a, now I've got a fold, which is going right across my trace. OK. And, and this happens all the time. We, we know, say, say, from ancient old pictures in art galleries. You, know, you have the picture that the artist has so carefully painted, and then it's full of cracks, because if the, the surface is cracking up. The cracks pay no attention, whatever, to all the traces that have gone across it. So that's in inscription there, eruption there. Then erosion. Well, erosion is quite unlike both inscription and eruption, because when you make a line, like, like this one here, the, all the movement is drawn to a focus at a particular point. It happened to be the, the point of my pen here. But in erosion, the movement is distributed over a surface. And in fact, it's like rubbing out. So I have a rubber here, and I could do this. I'm not going to be able to rub it out because I went and used a barrow pen, so it won't, won't come out. But I'll, So there we go. And notice that this rubbing out, it, we use the word um, wipe um, also, which comes from a, um, an ancient root, which, yan, which means an oscillatory movement. It's something like that. And that movement um, is not delivered from a point, but it covers a surface without delimiting it. One of the crucial things about this is that wherever you might want to draw a boundary, this movement of rubbing out transcends it. So it, it, it's a essentially boundary transcending surface oriented movement. And in that sense, completely different from the movement of inscription. OK, so now we've got those three kinds of, of process of, of, of inscription, eruption, and erosion. And I started thinking, well, how can we put these three movements together? And I'll, I'll begin with inscription and erosion. And I'd like to make a comparison with the process of writing. Uh, in medieval times, when people would write with ink on parchment. Now, parchment in those days was extremely expensive, so the same piece of parchment would be used over and over again. Uh, so when you write on parchment with ink, uh, the ink tends to soak in to the material. It's quite an absorbent material. It's a bit like, not quite like writing on blotting paper, but, but almost. So the, the, the ink sinks in. So then when you want to reuse the parchment, you have to take a pen knife, that is the knife that the scribe would otherwise use for sharpening his quill and scoring lines. You take the pen knife and scrape. You scrape and scrape and scrape, getting rid of some of the surface of the parchment until... Um, as much as you could get of the old inscription is removed, uh, and then you could write on it again. Um, but because the parchment is a highly absorbent material, it's completely impossible to get rid of all of those marks. So you end up writing on top of a parchment that already sort of has traces of the previous marks. 
And then that happens again, and you write again, and that happens again, and you write again, and you get the result is what paleographers call a palimpsest. Uh, and the palimpsest has been a very critical metaphor uh, way beyond paleography. It's extensively used by archaeologists um, whenever they think they've got sort of lots of traces in a, in a, on a site, on a settlement, that are sort of uh, going over one another. But most archaeologists think of a palimpsest in stratigraphic terms. So you had an early layer of occupation of a site, which left it traces, then a later layer, then a later layer, and a later layer, and you're an archaeologist, you can dig down and find each layer in succession. But actually, that's not how the palimpsest works. And it took me a long time to figure it out because it's very counterintuitive. And, and the way I did it was I was scribbling in my notebook and I, I ended up doing diagrams which I'll just, I'll just retrace now. I imagine here you are, uh, and this is a, a cross-section. Imagine a cross-section in which the, um, the inscription is marked in a highly exaggerated form. So here's the surface of the parchment. Now, these, these dents here are where you've put your pen into the surface, right? So the, 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 you, imagine, you imagine a cross-section of a, of a parchment with three lines on it, and, and it would look a bit like that. So that is something you do at time t naught. Then you want to use that uh, uh, parchment again at a later time. So you, you scrape off the top surface, and then so, so this bit here has kind of gone, and you do it again. Whoops. Like that. Right? And then you do it again at the next time. So this at the at the second time, this is the surface you've got. And the interesting thing that you notice about that is that the traces from the first inscription, from T0, are just there. They're about to disappear. Or maybe they already have disappeared. The traces from the second usage are fairly visible. The traces from your new usage, of course, very pronounced indeed. Now, what's happening here is that um, that old traces from the past are rising up to the surface as new traces are being dug deep down. This is the opposite of stratigraphy. Um, and, and you can imagine lots of examples of that. Even when you're out in the landscape, um, particularly if you're an archaeologist, if you say you're an archaeologist out in the landscape, um, field walking, and, and, and your interest, you want to detect, say, evidence of old pathways. From, from, from way back. And, and there are new or recent pathways that are very obviously visible, a new road here, a, um, an older cart tracks or something, that then if you have a trained eye, you can see just, just in the meadow or through a field, ah, there's the mark of an ancient path that's just about to disappear altogether through erosion, but it hasn't disappeared quite. quite. So out in the field there, the past appears through this process of erosion to be rising up while the present sinks down underneath it. Um, so, uh, in effect, um, the, um, th this principle is, is, is what I'm going to call anti-stratigraphic. It is the opposite of the stratigraphic principle. It's not a layering of the present over the past, but the past rising up even as the present sinks down. So anti-stratigraphy is a kind of turning over. And keep that in mind because I'm going to be returning to this idea of turning. So now that was dealing with um, the relationship between inscription and erosion. Erosion here is the equivalent to the penknife, um, but the same thing is happening on the ground. So now we have to bring in the third movement of eruption. And the point I want to make here is that the, the, the ground as palimpsest is what could be called a deep surface. 
Um, it's a surface that is formed when the ground's rising up or eruption meets the atmospheres or the weather's beating down or erosion. So I could, again, try and draw it like, I'll take another sheet for this, and, and try and draw it like this. But, you know, one, one way of you, you might draw a ground would be like this. Well, okay, there's, there's the atmosphere up here. Um, there's the earth down here. And in between is a kind of interface. And we'll call that the ground. And, um, uh, uh, and that it, um, by definition, an interface is a surface that separates what's on either side while allowing some kind of communication between the two. So on your computer keyboard, you know, you say, okay, you've got a, you've got a keyboard as an interface which is, lies between you and the inner workings of the machine. So you're on one side, the inner workings of the machine are on the other, but the keys allow some kind of communication from one side to the other. That's what an interface is, and one might suppose that, well, and some people do, that the ground is a kind of interface between the atmosphere and the earth. The atmosphere rises up, the earth sinks down, so that then gives you something like a world. Um, earth, atmosphere, with a ground in between. But let's say, to, let's put this the other way around and say that what we've really got is an atmosphere that is beating down on the Earth and an Earth that is rising up. So we've got the atmosphere's Earth beating down, the Earth's rising up, and here is a kind of zone of interpenetration. So this is eruption here, this upward arrow. This is erosion here, and there is the ground. And we can't really then say, you know, how deep is this ground? Or how far does it go down? Or how far does it go up? Because in fact, it goes far, you, could, you could go down as, as long as you like. You could go up as long as you like. It's not like a, a surface which has two sides to it and says, okay, there's the atmosphere on one side and there's the ground on the other side. It's actually where these two things are coming together and effectively merging. So what I'm calling the deep surface here is a zone, it's, it's not a, a, a separation, it's not an interfacial separation, but a zone of interpenetration. Now, one clue to this idea of the, the ground as a zone of interpenetration, at the ground as a deep surface, which works at least in the English language, but not in all others, even in Europe, lies in, in a, a curious double meaning of the verb to wear. Um, you know, you wear your clothes, um, you put them on, you cover yourself with them, but um, things are also worn down. Uh, you have a worn expression on your face uh, uh, when you've been doing too much university bureaucracy or things of this kind. So, so you can tell people have a, a, a wearing. But so, um, so wearing has this double sense. I'm, I'm wearing my clothes and I'm finding, and, and, and you're wearing your worry at the same time. Now, if your logic was a stratigraphic one, a logic of successive layers, then putting something on and wearing away would actually be completely contradictory. You know, one goes one way and one the other goes one way. The other way, you can't, you can't do both at once. But with the principle of the palimpsest, the anti-stratigraphic principle of the palimpsest, then those two kinds of wearing are in fact one, at the same, one and the same because <coughs> it is in the process of erosion that depth comes, as it were, to the surface. And this is a surface that covers but doesn't cover up. And you might think of... Uh, of the surface, for example, of, of a, a, a Renaissance statue. Maybe a sculptor would, uh, Michelangelo or whatever, would be carving with marble and produce uh, a surface which, uh, for example, is, is, a, is a beautifully flowing robes. And you can s look at the statue and marvel at the, at the flowingness of the texture of this marble. 
um, and say it's a female figure, but you don't think, oh, this is covering something up. You, know, you don't get titillated and think, well, what's underneath? Because it's actually that, that, that stone is not covering up the body of the figure in the sculpture. It is the body of that figure. So that the wearing that is done by the sculptor in, in removing, grinding away, polishing the stone is itself the way the, the surface of the sculpture is, is worn. Um, and we could say that the surface of the earth is a surface of that kind, uh, that it doesn't cover up, but that it covers. And John Ruskin um, wrote a whole lot about this uh, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, when he spoke of the, um, the earth as, as, a, as a veil. He used the metaphor of a veil. He, he didn't mean veil in the sense of... Um, of covering up. He had this idea that the thing about a veil is that you can, you, you, you can sort of see into it, but you don't see through it. Uh, and that's exactly what he wanted to get across with the nature of the ground. It's not something you go through to find the earth on the other side, but it is something that you can see into its inner depth. And that that depth then, as Ruskin put it, ministers to its inhabitants. So the earth comes up and gives, grants food and crops and all the other things that we depend on. So this idea that the past rises up as the present sinks down in a kind of turning movement is, um, oops, this, I just lost the, <laughs> I just lost the page. Where the hell have I, um, Oh, this is, excuse me a moment, I'm just, um, five, seven, eight. Well, I have to, I might just have to, I might just have to improvise where I was. Um, well, sorry about that, I don't know what, quite what, ah, here it is, phew, problem solved. Sorry about that. This, this, this idea of, of the Earth um, uh, going through this turning movement brings me to another concept, and that's the concept of volume. Um, and, and, and volume is really very interesting. We, we tend to think of volume now in terms of some sort of um, three-dimensional space with uh, x, y, and z axes that you could, could measure. Um, but I, I looked it up and found that the original meaning of volume was a scroll, a, a, a scroll of writing, uh, uh, because it um, comes from the, the Latin uh, uh, volvere, to, to roll or to turn. Uh, and, and so a scroll would be uh, rolled up, that, may, that is the original meaning of revolution, and then it would be unrolled if you wanted to read it, and that was the original meaning of evolution. So it'd be rolled up and unrolled like a carpet. And the th interesting thing is that when you roll up a carpet, its lower and upper regions are inverted. It goes up and over. And you try, imagine you're rolling up a carpet, then the underside of the carpet ends up being on top when you, when you turn it over like that. Um, now, historically, I mean, the, 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 the volume started as the scroll. Historically, uh, in the history of, of uh, Europe anyway, the scroll led to the codex, that is the, the book of parchment. Um, and in the codex, every page is effectively a fold. So imagine that you took the whole length of the scroll and instead of rolling it up, you sort of made a like, concertina out of it. Then, then effectively that you've created a whole lot of, of pages. And in the codex, you go from page to page, not by um, unrolling, but by turning. You turn the page. And as you turn the page, what was under becomes over, and what was over goes under. But the critical thing is you can't go through the page. The page is like the mythical Janus, you know, with heads pointing in two ways. And you can't just go through Janus from one side to the other. The only way you can get from one side of the page to the other is actually by 
turning it. So you can't think of the parchment page in any sense as an interface that sets off one side from another. So the page, recto and verso, faces both ways. Sorry about these detour about books, but we'll get back to the ground in a moment. So then what happened eventually with the printed book, um, th where you are no longer writing into parchment, but stamping um, the printed text on the surface of paper, then in the printed book, you begin to think of the book as a layer, like a stack of, of paper. So with that, and what we now call a volume, is a stratified entity consisting of lots and lots of pages forming a stack, and you can work down the stack. So the volume is now comparable not to a rolled up surface, but to a box or a container to be filled with contents. So that's how we now have our idea of the volume as a, as a box with contents, which can be stratified into layers. Well, let's get back to the ground. Um, maybe you can't exactly roll up the ground like a carpet. And maybe, except perhaps people from garden centres, you know, who deal with turfing and they, they have these rolls of turf. But, but that, that's sort of slightly exceptional. But, but on the whole, you, you can't. If you're a farmer with a field, you can't just decide to roll up your, your field like a carpet. But you can turn the ground. In fact, turning is absolutely critical to, um, to, 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 agricultural, to the agricultural cycle of ploughing, sowing, and harvesting. And the purpose of the plough is to turn the soil, and the purpose of turning the soil is to bring up nutrient-rich soil from below, and at the same time to bury um, the ground that was used previously, which is full of all sorts of rubbish and weeds and um, a bit drained of nutrients. So you bury the used-up stuff, and you bring the nutrient-rich stuff um, down from beneath. So turning, turning the soil itself is, is itself a critical uh, operation, but that operation of ploughing is just one part of the agricultural cycle, which obviously includes also sowing and harvesting. Um, so we talk about the, 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 the agricultural cycle as following the turn of the seasons. So time itself is revolving in that kind of way in a, let's say, traditional agricultural agrarian regime. And in the turn of the seasons, what happens, as with the palimpsest, is that old memories that would otherwise be buried rise up to the surface so that you can engage with them directly. That's how medieval people read. They didn't think of their books in any sense as an archive of knowledge. They didn't dig down the stack to find something ancient buried down beneath. The point of the book was to bring uh, the lives of past people, of saints, of biblical events, because it was mostly liturgical reading, into the present so that you could have a conversation with them because it was felt that the pages of a book actually speak to you with the memories that they contain. So, so remembering is like um, meet, meeting an old friend you haven't seen for a while and say, oh, hello, yes, of course I remember you. And the friend is right there in front of you. It's not somebody you've dug up um, from the archive. So, um, so that, that's what, what, what memory means when, when with, a, with the anti-stratigraphic principle of, of turning the soil. But once the volume is a box or a container with stratified contents, then time cuts orthogonally through the strata, and you get the classic dichotomy between synchrony and diachrony. So, um, so once you're beginning to think of, 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 um, of a series of strata like this, with the old strata down below and newer strata down uh, up above, each of these then is a synchronic slice, and um, if you're an archaeologist or a historian or whatever, you go diachronically down, cut through the strata in order to find out about the past. So to reach the past, like an archaeologist, you have to excavate. And if you're going in the other way, 
you want to go out this way. Renewal doesn't mean turning the ground, as it did in the traditional agricultural cycle. It means always adding new layers, one upon the other, so as to form a stack. You raise whatever there is to the ground, build over, build over, build over, build over. So the idea is that, um, is that stuff accumulates as a series of stratigraphic layers. Now I want to introduce another distinction that we often make, um, and that is between soft and hard. Because when we talk about the ground that the farmer turns with his plough, the earth, that's kind of soft. In fact, you can only plough it as long as it does have a certain degree of, of softness. But when we talk about the ground as a series of layers, one put placed over the other, the ground appears to be hard. So the soft ground is absorbent, the hard ground is not absorbent. And the soft ground takes things into it, the hard ground you put things on top of it. Um, and well, to just to, to um, demonstrate that, let me make a comparison between footprints and stamps. The thing about footprints um, is that they're most readily made on soft surfaces. And you know this very well, that, that we don't often leave much of a footprint when we're walking on a hard pavement in the city, but if we go walking in the countryside in, in wet mud or the beach on sand or in winter in the snow, then of course we're leaving footprints all the time. And those footprints are there because the surface we're standing on is relatively soft and, and takes the, the, the print. Um, so it could be a surface of sand, of snow, a wet moss, of mud. But for that very same reason, because the ground is soft, those prints are very readily eroded by the weather. So they don't necessarily last very long. So prints, footprints in that sense, are temporal, and they're held within the seasonal round. And they are, in that sense, also anti stratigraphic. With the stamp, on the other hand, it's quite the other way around, because with the stamp, I'm, in, I'm imagining it's something that is imposed from above. Uh, it is impressed from above, like um, as in a printing press, but also in, in various kinds of building. Uh, and that principle, then, is a stratigraphic one. Now, um, if we wanted to compare the two, we could, don't, we could say, well, well, the typical of a, of a hard surface, of a hard ground, would be paving. Typical of uh, soft ground would be uh, the soft <coughs> earth. Now, paving is rather interesting. We, we, we paving, all, uh, pa paving enormous uh, areas of, of um, the ground, the, the earth's surface, all the time. I don't know what the figures are at the moment, but I read somewhere you know, that um, we're paving some area with the size of Berlin every 10 years or something. So, it's a, so we're gradually paving over the earth. And the thing about paving is that it does have upper and lower sides. I mean, we have a little paved area in our garden, and there's a paving stones that lay lead. And if I really go wanted to, I could bend, pick, pick one up. It'd be, be heavy, um, but then I could pick it up, and there's this slab, and yes, it's got a top side, and it's got an underside. And, and you could say uh, that according to um, the model I had earlier, if I can find it, that, well, I'll draw it, I'll draw it again. You could, you could say of a, of a paving stone, okay, there's a cross section of a paving stone, and it's got a top side, and it's got an underside. No problem. So um, the paving is, in that sense, interfacial. And the other thing about paving is that it does have a certain depth. I mean, you can measure the depth. You can measure the thickness of a paving stone. And you can also say that the support offered by that paving stone is, in some sense, conditional. It's conditional on the strength and the load-bearing capacity of its material. We can say, OK, here's, here is some slab of material. How much will it bear? And when you stand on it, you think, um, 
You know, will it carry my weight or not? And, and anybody who's been going on ice knows that. I mean, if you're going out on ice, uh, it's a matter of uh, a life or death decision. Is this ice yet thick enough to carry the load of me and my snowmobile or whatever else I've equipped? And, and if it isn't, you're going to fall through. So, so there's a very clear sense that, um, that you experience the paved ground or actually the iced over ground as a thing that has a top side and an underside that has a certain load-bearing capacity. And you feel that. You feel that the support that that ground offers is conditional. It's not unconditional. It's conditional on, is the ice thick enough? Is this strong enough to bear my weight? And so on. But with bare earth, it's quite different. Because bare earth, like the page of a codex in a parchment book, has only one side. It is open to the atmosphere, rising up or erupting in its outcrops or in its vegetation. And when you stand on that earth, its depth is felt at the surface, but its depth is immeasurable. So it's quite different. With the paving, you don't really feel the depth at the surface. You feel the depth in that thickness, but you can measure the thickness. With the bare earth, you, you, um, you can, you, 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 you can uh, feel the depth at the surface, but the depth itself is immeasurable. But the support that that bare earth gives is unconditional. That is to say, you can, uh, you can fall over, you can fall on the earth, you can fall into it, maybe, if it's a um, bit of a ditch or something, you fall in, but you can't fall through. There's no way of going through to the other side. So the earth, the soft earth as such, it can have pits, it can have potholes, but it can't have gaps or real holes. And when you drive over a pothole, you don't expect your car to go hurtling down into the underworld. Not yet, anyway. So then the question that, that that then leads to is whether we should think of the earth as open or closed. Is the earth uh, closed, like with paving, or is it open, like that bare earth? Is it, and I, I began to think, because I couldn't answer this question, that it's not one or the other, but it's really both. And that perhaps what we're really talking about with the ground is that it is, it is being formed through a continual double movement of what I could call exposure, which is an opening up, and encrustation, which is a closing down. That the two things are going on at once, an opening and a closing. And then I was thinking about that, and I realized that this double movement of opening and closing, closing of exposure and encrustation, is of the essence of burial. That's what happens when stuff or a person or whatever gets buried. Now imagine that you're, you're burying a body in the conventional way, in a, in a grave. So uh, you, you first you have to open the earth, dig a pit of some kind, that's the grave digger's job. And then you lay the body in the embrace of this pit. OK, you've done all that. You've got your, not a hole exactly, but you've got a pit in the ground. You put the body in the pit. And then what you do, you cover it over with a slab. So you've got something like this. Uh, I'll just draw this. So first of all, uh, you dug your pit. This is cross-section again. This is the soft earth. Then you put your body in the pit. There he is. And then, um, and then you, you cover it over. With a sto maybe a stone slab or whatever it happens to be like that. So, so there you've opened the ground and then you've closed it. And this slab is an interface. It's like a paving stone. It's got, it's got a top and it's got a bottom. So now the body is buried below the ground. But then over time, what happens is that earth and vegetation will begin through natural processes to grow over, to cover this slab. Uh, and after a while, you know, um, there'll be trees and bushes and so on. And everybody's forgotten about 
this underneath uh, so that the burial site itself will be indistinguishable from its surroundings until all of a sudden it is rediscovered by an archaeologist or somebody, somebody who happens to, to or find some clue and suddenly discover, wow, um, we just thought this was a bit of field, but underneath uh, there's, a, there's a slab here and underneath the slab there's a body. Um, so, and, and, and then camouflage actually works, I think, on much, well, not all camouflage, but some kinds of camouflage work on the same principle. Um, it's not just that a thing, say, say you're a military commander, you know, and you want to hide your tanks, and you, so you, you cover your tanks with, um, with, with, with fabric that is painted in the colours of green and brown and so on, and so, that, so that somebody flying over from the air would not be able to distinguish this camouflage sheet from this regular uh, ground covered with vegetation. So what's happening there is not just that the, your tanks are hidden under the sheet from direct view of the reconnaissance plane flying overhead, but, but it's that what is actually a closed interfacial surface, that is the sheet, is made to look like an open and deep one, fooling us into thinking that just not, not just that there is not, but there cannot be anything underneath. Okay, so the, 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 the camouflage sheet is not just hiding your tanks, your military hardware from view, it's fooling us into thinking that what we're looking at is simply the open ground. And if you think of the open ground in that way, then it can't possibly have anything underneath because the open ground is a deep surface. It's not an interface. So that's how that sort of camouflage system works. But there's a much more sinister, uh, well, maybe that's sinister, but there are much more, more sinister applications of the same principle um, in some sites in Germany and also in Finland, um, there, there are currently uh, plans, which I'm not sure what stage they're at, whether it's actually happening yet, to, to bury uh, old nuclear waste from nuclear power stations uh, at the bottom of old mine shafts. And in the proper propaganda material that's put out in this, uh, they have a picture which shows these areas in Finland, for example, where they're going to do this, um, very old mine workings, but, but then they show the picture. It's pristine forest with you know, animals romping around and uh, everything, uh, bears, wolves, uh, uh, and, and the odd hunter, and you wouldn't know that anything was there. And, and the, the logic of this is that if you cover over the top of the mine working and eventually it becomes indistinguishable from the open ground around it, then effectively what is buried there is completely blotted out from memory. You won't even know that it's there. And the question is, is that, is that actually possible? Can we forget? Um, well, clearly, if there are different ways of thinking about memory, um, which I mentioned, so the, the difference between the scroll and the stack, or between the palimpsest and the archive, memory as engaging with voices brought into the present versus memory as digging down to the bottom of the stack and digging the information out. If there are different ways of thinking about memory, then too there must be different ways of thinking about forgetting. So I wanted to return to this notion of erosion or wiping, as you do with the rubber, wiping stuff out, rubbing, rubbing things out. And I wondered, what is the difference, actually, between erosion and burial? Because, in a sense, both of them could be understood as ways of forgetting. Um, when you rub something out, uh, okay, you've written something and you don't want anybody to see, you want to forget that you wrote it, you rub it out. Or you could bury it somewhere down a mine shaft or, or what, whatever. But, um, but these seem to offer alternative ways of forgetting. 
in the sense that with erosion, the surface is open, so stuff is brought up and then eventually wiped away. But with burying, you're putting stuff down, so it's going like this in this direction. But then what if we put those two together? If we, if we put together burying, erosion, burying, burying and erosion together, then we'd have a movement of erosion like this and a movement of burying like that. And that, in effect, would reconstitute that whole cycle of turning uh, through which I think, in, if I've got an argument at all, that it's through that turning process that the ground is continually formed. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Right, the mic wasn't there. Oh, I was in one of these. Okay, that's what it's going to take. Um. Yes, it is now. Thank you, Tim, for that extraordinary presentation. Um, how we are structuring this, I'm going to make a brief response, if I dare, to that <laughs> extraordinary... Um, I'm more nervous than you were, Ed. Um, and then we'll open it to the floor. Tim's t kindly agreed that he will take some questions for, for a short while. Um, we probably have about 20 minutes, if mm. that's okay. Um, so, as I was listening to you, Tim, I, I, I sort of thought, and it happened with Ivor before on the panel that I spoke on, there's something that's kind of moving through the thinking at this symposium so far that's been extraordinarily, um, um, th that's really set up a conversation that's quite synergistic, I suppose, is the right word. In fact, I was going to use the, pa the, 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 the stone scissor paper game as part of my talk oh. this evening. This oh, sorry. But I decided to leave that out because I didn't have time and then you told that story. So that was extraordinary. But I suppose what I'm quite interested in, because it came up earlier too, is the anti-stratigraphic position that you're taking. Um, we asked earlier, for those of you who weren't here, maybe we should actually forget about the idea of strata altogether and maybe actually sediment is a more, more uh, a sort of open-minded idea about strata and Tim says, no, we can, we're going to take an anti-stratigraphic <laughs> position. And my question really is, is the Earth itself not anti-stratigraphic? Because I think the idea that the Earth is formed in these neat wow. layers that, that, that stratigraphers and archaeologists dig through is, to my mind, completely negated by the Earth itself, which is far more, is, is far more, it, it, it throws to the surface the things that were in the past and we actually don't even have to dig down because they, they, they emerge on their own. So I, th I think that you're probably touching on something that's probably about the, l the limits of a, an of a science or an epistemologic position that has to layer things and stack things in ways that are quite actually, qu they're, they're kind of averaging and generalizing um, in ways that don't exist. Um, I could go on, but I think that that was the main thing okay. I wanted to comment on. You're absolutely right. The Earth is, is very definitely anti-stratigraphic. Um, it keeps erupting. Mm -hmm. and, and um, but, but, but on the other hand, geological science is very heavily invested in the stratigraphic principle um, for reasons of its own, for partly to do with the way it thinks about time and epochs. Um, uh, it, uh, and because it, there, there is a, it's, it's a bit lazy to attribute things to modernity, but there's, there, there, is a, there is a current of, of modern thought that leads one to be thinking in this kind of way and, and geological sciences exists now 
is clearly something that's been formed within that current of thought. What would be really interesting would be to go back a bit, I think, into the history of geology um, to authors where that way of thinking about strata had yet to be firmly established. And, and when you were talking earlier, I mean, before my talk, um, I, was, I was just trying to remember there's, a, there's a, a Danish author from Kirsten, you know, the, the name of the, this Danish author who, who wrote a treatise in the 17th century on how a solid can be embedded in a solid. And, and, and it is in the history of, I, that's the name's gone out of my head, but, but, um, but it, it, it all s revolved around the discovery of a shark's tooth in a, in a um, lock of what we would now call sedimentary rock. And, and it was argued then for the first time that what must have happened was that at one point this shark's tooth was in a fairly watery uh, medium or belonged to a shark, but that, but that particles had settled and eventually turned into rock. So that was, that was sort of the, f when, when at that point, that was a novel thing to say. We didn't take stratification for granted. And, and the idea that how you could have one solid thing in turn inside another solid thing, it seemed most bizarre. So, so maybe that would help to give us a handle on, on these things. Right, are there any questions, comments from the floor? We'd like to give you the chance to respond. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great, uh, great lecture. I, I, I was wondering whether there is anything worthy in discussing about the composition of the ground mm. um, in regards to you, know, you. You talk about you know making footprints on sand, and um, you talk about the farmer's field. But sort of the composition of ground varies quite significantly mm. in regards to its stoniness, the type of stone, um, the type of soil. And I was wondering whether is there anything as significant in or anything worthy of discussion uh, in regards to uh, what you were um, oh presenting. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, the bit, well once once you've got past all these generalities, then then the f then it gets really begins to get interesting because you can look at all the different kinds of of ground conditions there can be, and 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 that that throws up just endless puzzles. Uh, as for example, you. Know, you're going for a walk, um, and your walk might encompass uh, some ground that's a bit damp and mossy in one place. It might encompass a rocky outcrop in another, and and you know, some places you're leaving footmarks, but you, you but on that rocky outcrop, you're never going to leave any footmarks because it's a granite, oh, ice scoured granite surface. So then. There would get really interesting questions about how that, how, how, for example, a rocky outcrop and a mire can be part of a, an environmental totality that might be experienced every day by people who live in such an environment and yet appear to offer or afford such very different ex experiences. And this is a, it's a similar sort of puzzle that I've often wondered about. I mean, when I did field work in, in Lapland and uh, years and years ago, and, and everybody would, there would have their own footpath. And this is a sort of um, forest tundra environment, lots of lakes. So a footpath would often involve in include a section uh, in which you actually take your rowboat across a lake, and you have your boat there. And, and it'd be perfectly natural. You'd walk along there, get your boat, cross, go across, carry on. And it was simply part of your your walk. But of course, on the land, there's a, a path, you can see it and it's marked. On the water, nothing. Uh, and I've often puzzled about that. Now, how do you reconcile these things? And I still don't really have an answer to it. But it's the same with different kinds of ground. I, th I, th I think I can extend the puzzle slightly. Um, because I had the experience some years ago in Massachusetts of walking out on a quaking bog. Mm. And a quaking bog is a mat of sphagnum that's floated out over yeah. the surface of a pond. And mm. you need to 
keep moving so that you don't sink in. Yeah. So it's, you know, the ground is really untrustworthy in that sort of situation. When you get to the center of the pond, the sphagnum yeah. moss gets ever thinner and yeah. ever less trustworthy. So it's a kind of, it's almost like a fake ground or a, yeah. um, but then that brings water into the question and whether the surface of water is a ground. I mean, you could certainly draw it as exactly. a ground. You could draw mm. ships as a figure mm. and the water as a, as a, as a ground. And, and as you said, you can feel the depth at the surface, but the depth itself is immeasurable. So it operates like a ground in, mm. in, in that regard. But is mm. it? I've been thinking about this and I've, and I've come to the conclusion that actually there's a real difference when you go from the ground surface to the water surface and that it does affect one's experience that, um, how to put it, I mean, I, I know this experience about walking in, uh, on, on smag smagnum and you have to go fast and you, you, you and it's a bit scary and, it, and it's, it's like <laughs> being on one of those sort of floating, those mattresses, you know, where you, you go down on one bit and it goes up on, on, on the other. But, but the, the, th the thing is that, um, that when you're on land, when you're on terra firma and, and we are, terrestrial animals, basically. When you're on terra firma, you can, um, in a sense, assume that um, a hold, you can assume that you will be held by the land. Uh, once you're at sea, you can't, and people are hold on to one another in order to keep themselves afloat. And I, and I, I, I have a sense that that leads this leads to a quite different kind of, of sociality, for example, between the sociality uh, on land and on board ship. Uh, and you find some clues to this in the narratives of Viking seafarers, for example, how they would relate to one another on the land and on the, and on the sea, a very different thing. And, and, and a jetty you know, is different from a bridge because it, it, it takes you out so far and, and then you can't get the jetty any further because it's the sort of water level's too deep. And then you go into something where there is no longer that existential support. Uh, and like on that sphagnum moss, you know, if you're swimming, you can only, you have to just keep swimming or you're going to sink. Uh, you can't just decide to, s <coughs> to stay where you are. So I, I think that there is a, I think, I think that we're mistaken to, to compare the surface of water, of the sea, or of a lake, and say it's just the same as the as the surface of of the land, and then the the, the moss, the mire, is sort of somewhere in between the two. But it's a real puzzle. It's a very interesting puzzle. Well, I heard uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting talk. Um, I, I wanted to take a slightly different tack and ask you something about your method, <coughs> the way in which you got one. <laughs> generate these ideas. Because I, I was very struck that I, I think the sort of key to it in my mind was something to do with the relationship between words and things. Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about something very material, but you quite often are using a kind of word play mm. to open up kind mm. of avenues of thinking about it. So, for example, your use of the word whirring yeah. and its double meaning. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting in the context of what I understand that Lindsay is trying to do, because we, we had a presentation earlier where I got a sense that there is a kind of visual poetics of scientific information that she is trying to develop. And th this seems to me to relate to I quite I, something one might say that's quite controversial because mm. of your say using wordplay to talk about materials and you kind of alluded to a critique of uh, mainstream science in in terms of geology. I just wondered if you uh, would like to say something mm. about that. I, I I mean I do love I mean these, these particularly these 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 ancient usually quite short words that uh, and 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 what they do is 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 they they make you think about questions and possible connections that you hadn't thought about. You you find that there's the a word has has many meanings and you think why this combination of meanings and 
and how can this be connected to that? And, and, and that opens up a question that it's a particular problem for, I'm an anthropologist, and, and, it's, and, and it's a particular problem for anthropologists because the, the criticism, for example, that I often get, perfectly valid criticism, if I'm, if I'm doing this kind of word stuff and I'm using English words, or if I'm going back to Latin roots, you say, well, that's all very well, you know, but um, there are lots of other languages in the world, and, um, and how's your argument going to stand up? Uh, because, you know, if I'm working in Arabic or if I'm working in, in, in Japanese or something like that, uh, I could do the same, I can play the same games, but I'm going to come out with completely different conclusions, to which the only response can be, that's fine. Uh, let's have, you know, the, the more the merrier. That, that, that it's not as though one's trying to discover the truth of things or to, to validate your argument with respect to this, but simply that, um, that it opens up uh, a question. And I think I would want to say that it's a bit more than wordplay. Um, because it, I, I know what you mean, but, but words are, are, are they're real things and, and, and they're, they have this tremendous, you know, every time when you speak a word and you think, wow, the people have been speaking that word, other people, for hundreds of years, in all sorts of different ways, and here am I speaking it, and you, you think of that, just that, that, how much is compressed in, in, in a word. Um, it's not unlike the compression that you might find in a piece of land. I mean, it's a phenomenon of the same order. I think. Thanks. Um, I think I wanted to problematize the rock paper scissors idea and even though <laughs> the, there's a certain equality there there seems to be like a whole set of zero sum games and um i was thinking if we were in the anthropocene where things were a little bit more related to each other how would it work and eruptions how would they work some things would go up and things would go down erosion things don't go away because there's no away they're just redistributing things um, and if that binary between erosions and eruptions was possibly problematic what would happen in terms of the footprints and that relationship it seems that the, not the ground is untouched in a stacky way but of course it isn't because something is happening with that footprint either your skin is getting worn away or your shoe is being worn out the harder the ground is what happens to that skin? What happens to that leather or rubber or whatever? It goes in the ground. And so what initially seems to be a separation and a zero-sum game um, is sort of going to be problematized mm. because I, there's something limiting about the rock, scissors, paper thing, I think, in our contemporary set of sensitivities. So I just wanted to... Mm. I'm not sure about the zero. I, 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 I agree it's a, it's a blunt instrument, but... Uh, but and I'm not sure that it works myself. I'm not sure about the zero-sum game, but I, what, I, what I would take from your comment is that the problem with the game as it's formulated is that um, the, the, these three things, they stay pretty much to themselves. I mean, that, that's to say, the stone bits of stone don't rub off <laughs> onto, the, onto the scissors when you're trying. Uh, and and um, uh, so there's no... There's, there's, um, there's no f uh, slippage of, of, of materials across these nice boundaries. You've got your scissors, you've got your paper, you've got your stone. And, and they remain, for the, in the context of the game, absolutely discreet. And that's how the game works. And if one applied it literally to what I was talking about, then you would have to end up talking in the same sort of way which doesn't really work because um, you know even erosion doesn't happen like that I mean, we saw your films of uh, of the um, saltation going on you can see that it's, it, it, it involves enormously complex complicated fluid dyma dynamics and, and 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 so that game scenario doesn't get get anywhere near that so I, I think yeah I, I I would it was just an idea and I, I think it's it's helpful it's helped me just to get 
just to lay down some initial terms to start thinking with. And actually, when I first started thinking about it, it wasn't long ago, um, I was working on this parallel between the page and the ground mm -hmm. and thinking about you know, what happens with a, with a pen, paper, and rubber and thought that one could use the same logic there. If there's one thing I would like to hang on to it, though, is, is the sense that um, the beauty of the game is that they're all encompassed within the system so that no one of these, it's a circular logic, and you can't take any one of them out and say that this is the prime mover. Uh, and I like, I mean, that, that's sort of, I found, I found helpful in it. But I, I don't think, like all these things, one shouldn't take it too literally. Uh, hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I, uh, I have two questions. The first question is, um, it's rather a personal one because whenever I think of rupture, um, I, I, I tend to imagine bulldozers and mm. essentially machineries that enable uh, the North to be the North, uh, London to be London. Um, I mean, ruptures is something that actually uh, disables a world which you're describing in a way, which is sort of burials and sort of thinking about footprints. Uh, ruptures is something that actually creates a form of exquisite stability uh, through violence. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, so that's the first part of my question. The second part, so I in, in a way, they, these drawings do open up um, an, imagine, an imaginary of thinking, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, the use of drawing as, as a method, right? I mean, uh, I mean, th there seems to be a conversation be between anthropology and drawing, and in a, in a way, drawing is something to, uh, as a way to inculcate a sight. Or I mean, so I was wondering. If, I mean, if, if there was something going on uh, between um, these particular ideas that you use, for example, of the burial of footprints of um, uh, uh, of folding and 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 uh, obs observation in general. I was wondering if. Mm. If there is a certain kind of attachment you want to propagate, or is a certain kind of detachment you want to propagate, and or is is the Anthropocene in a way a certain kind of plowing by itself, because nobody plows. I mean, these days anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, well, and people so do. Um, you wouldn't have your potatoes uh, if if they didn't. But um, uh, f first of all. Um, well, well, let me first preface, preface that answer by saying that I'm not, a, I, I'm not an Anthropocene convert. I, I in, um, I'm deeply, s I'm not skeptical of the fact that immense changes and rather destructive changes are going on, but I, I'm deeply skeptical of the Anthropocene as a concept with which to grasp this for all sorts of reasons that we <coughs> don't have time to discuss now. Um, but but the bull d I, it seems to me that, that, that um, there is a, a, a violent uh, antagonism today between the, the, the anti-stratigraphic and stratigraphic logics. Uh, the stratigraphic logic is a, a logic that is tied to uh, global globalization and development as it's normally understood. And the principal agents of that, I think, are the bulldozer and the crane, and perhaps also concrete, but anyway, those two. Um, because what a bulldozer is doing in, in smashing through, turning what, whatever was there, um, be it a forest or somebody's village or whatever it might be, and turning basically into, into a level waste, which can then be covered over and have skyscrapers put on it. Um, and you need the crane for the skyscrapers, is, is, is imposing a, stratif a stratificatory logic on a non-stratified, originally non-stratified world. And to do that, you can only do that by, by violence, which is what the bulldozer does. And that, that, that's my understanding of it. Um, when it comes to to the question about drawing and kind of what's going on when I'm sitting there with my pen and paper, I, I, um, I just find that uh, 
um, when I'm trying to when I'm trying to work ideas out, um, then I write and I draw and my notebooks are full of this kind of stuff and 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 I really like it because um, it, it allows you in this context to join in with a, what is basically a process of working things out. Um, I, I, I get rather fed up with the. Um, the, the typical academic conference setup in which you are supposed to present thoughts which are fully formed and finished and you know this is what I found these are my findings <laughs> your PowerPoint <laughs> and, and I, I really detest that <laughs> and, and, and so I'm trying to find every possible way of not doing it <laughs> thanks beings we, we can't help but be both stratigraphic and anti-stratigraphic at the same time and and partly because I, I really enjoyed the story that you were telling at the end of the radioactive material that was buried in Germany and on one hand it's it's covered over and there's a camouflage and you can see it from the air that you know there's animals and things running around and it looks like some kind of wonderful little forest that you could you might have seen in the medieval times mm. but we know that underneath, so that's a kind of stratigraphic view or uh, approach that, the ger uh, that Germany has taken to it. And then below it is this kind of radioactive material mm. that we absolutely know is mm. something kind of lurking there that might sort of rise to the surface. So in a way, it's our, our, our kind of belief systems as humans can't, can't assume to be one or the other because... Once we're told, okay, we are stratigraphic and this is the way we work, we say, well, no, wait a minute, you know, I'm certainly not going to build my house on top of that, um, that stuff. So I think there's a kind of innate thing within us to, to, to understand these kind of things that don't make sense when we see them, but no, in fact, you know, we shouldn't go there. And what, what, what you thought of that? There's a couple of thoughts. One's, one's, um, one is that, of course, there... We we have no idea what's under there. I mean, to think think about some of the, the those enormous um, uh, royal burials in China, uh, where, where or, or or even the, you know, ancient Egypt, um, where um, it was I think in the Chinese case nothing more than a chance discovery that maybe hey, there's something funny here, and and then you discover this enormous tomb complex, which which nobody, as far as I know. Uh, nobody actually knew about at all. So, um, so you know, I, I think it's a historical fact that some things actually have been uh, complete forgotten, and when they're discovered, it's come as a complete surprise. Other things obviously haven't. And the and the the interesting, or puzzling, or disturbing question about the nuclear waste thing is is whether you know a future scenario. Whether, whether you can so to speak plan a future scenario in which something will be completely forgotten in the same way that the tombs of the Chinese emperors were. Um, and I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But there, there, then there's a, there's a more tricky sort of um, philosophical point <laughs> that, that um, in my head goes back to Deleuzean distinction between I'm sorry about this, between the life and a life. He makes this distinction, the life is basically your CV, you know, you, 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 your career, you know, what you've done, and, and the rest of it. A life is, is sort of life itself. And um, we could say, stratigraphically, in that sense, that yes, we, we, we're supposed to do, we're supposed to make something of our lives. We're supposed to build, we're supposed to do, we're supposed to create something for future generations. So, and, and then say at the end, you know, I've done this. So we have this idea that, that we are building some sort of monument on foundations, which will then persist for future generations. But behind that is always lurking 
the sense of the sheer fragility of life itself, the sense that actually um, one is not on firm ground at all, but sort of floating uh, in on, on a very thin membrane that at any moment you could just slip. Um, and that's you finished. That was what happens to all of us. So I, I think in that sense, I think you're right, that, um, that these two things uh, are co-present and inseparable. We hope to see some of you back tomorrow morning at 9.30. Thank you.